Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Ronald Reagan in Salad Days on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a dramatization of a book by Helen and Bellamy Partridge called Salad Days. Mr. Partridge takes his title from Shakespeare, one of whose characters talks of his salad days when he was green in judgment. This symbol of youth charmingly fits Mr. Partridge's recollections of his own youth, the trials and tribulations and also the joys and sorrows and excitements of a boy going to an upstate New York college in the gay 90s. Those of us who are old enough, and also those of us who are young enough, will get the flavor, I think. And to star as the young Mr. Partridge, we have that fine actor, Ronald Reagan. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. One of the particular joys of Christmas is sending and receiving Christmas cards. While the pleasure Christmas cards bring can never be measured, Isn't it good to know that Hallmark cards are priced the same this year as they were last year, and the year before, and the year before that, and that the quality of Hallmark cards has constantly improved throughout the years? Yes, today, just as for many Christmas seasons, that Hallmark on the back of your card is looked for and welcomed. It tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Bellamy and Helen Partridge's Salad Days, starring Ronald Reagan. There often comes a moment in a man's life when something quite accidental crops up to set him thinking back over the past, when he lets down a net, as it were, into the deep sea of memory and hauls up whatever comes the important and the trivial, the sad and the happy, the serious and the funny. Just such a moment came to a lawyer named Bellamy Partridge when his young son jogged his elbow and made him put down the evening paper. Daddy, what are these funny old pictures? Son, where on earth did you find that old album? In the attic. Let me see. Oh, yeah. These are pictures of days when I was going to school. See, there I am. Look at that high collar and those pointed shoes. <laughs> I certainly thought I was the OU kid in those days. What's that building you're standing in front of? That's the old dormitory at Hobart College. That's where I lived when I was going to Hobart. Who's that funny-looking guy? That's Jim Chase. He was my roommate. He was a junior when I was a freshman. <laughs> I can see Jim now running to the window and shouting, heads out. What did that mean? That meant the girls from the Delancey School were marching by. We'd all run to the window and hang out to watch them go by. Heads out. I can hear Jim saying it just as though I was still living those days. Heads out! Heads Heads out! out. Heads out! There's my girl. See that dark-haired one with bangs? Who's the blonde one walking with her? You're not supposed to ask questions about girls, freshman. Why not? Freshmen aren't allowed to think about girls. I'd like to know how anyone's going to stop me from thinking about that one. Well, if you really want to know, that's Judge Dwinell's daughter, Judy. But it won't do you any good because half the upperclassmen in school are stuck on her. Do you know her? Sure, I've met her. She's my girlfriend's roommate. But don't ask me to introduce you. Upperclassmen do not introduce freshmen to girls. How do you meet a girl like that? You have to wangle an invitation to one of the teas they give at Delancey School. But freshmen can't wangle invitations. Well, maybe this freshman can. You're pretty fresh, freshman. You're 
pretty fresh freshman, Jim said. And he was right, I was. But Judy Dwinell had walked by my dorm windows. I saw her pass and was hers from that moment forward. I don't know why you wanted to be bothered with a girl. Well, you will when you get to be a little older. Whose picture is this? Let's see. Oh, that's Professor Turk. I majored in English under him. Look at that black beard. When I got mad, which happened almost every hour on the hour, that beard fairly bristled. And do you see those beady little eyes? Let me tell you, when he fixed those eyes on you, it was something to really make you freeze in your seat. Professor Turk always seemed to have it in for me. I can hear him now saying, Mr. Partridge? Mr. Partridge? Mr. Partridge? Did you hear me addressing you, sir? Uh, yes, Professor. Tain, why don't you answer me? Uh, I did answer you. Only after I spoke to you three times. I'm sorry, sir, I didn't hear you. Mr. Partridge, if you do not pay attention, you will leave this class as unforgivably uninformed as you entered it. Yes, sir. Now then, Mr. Partridge, you have chosen to write a paper for this class on the subject of college English courses. You say that some of the books that students are required to read are among the dullest that ever came off a printing press. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know you were going to discuss our papers in front of the class. Indeed? Do you think I can hold an individual session with each individual member of this class on each individual subject? Well, I guess I didn't think about it, Professor Turk. You didn't think much about this paper you wrote, either. Would you be so kind as to name for the class some of the books you consider the dullest that ever came out of a printing press? Well, I was thinking of, well, books like, like The Mill on the Floss. Were you really? And what else, Mr. Partridge? I, I don't seem to remember, Professor Turk. Oh, come now, at least have the spunk to stick up for your own convictions. What other books? Well, some of the works of Carlyle and Thoreau. Carlyle and Thoreau and Eliot. Authors of books that have stood the test of time as great literature. Yet you, Bellamy Partridge, a freshman at Hobart College, have decided they are dull and not worth reading. Mr. Partridge, I want you to prepare an individual paper on each of the books you have so criticized, telling me why you find them dull and unrewarding. And while you are writing the papers, kindly try to improve your abominable punctuation, Mr. Partridge. Yes, Professor Turk. And by the way, I rather admire your independent mind. Keep it up. But Professor Turk continued to give me a bad time. I was the student most often called on in class, most often called down in class, most often kept after class. I thought old Turk really had it in for me until one day toward the end of the term, it kept me after class. Just as I was leaving, he said to me, Mr. Partridge, I'd like to say something to you. Mr. Mr. Partridge, Partridge, I'd, I'd like, like to, to say something to you. to you. I really think that you uh, think I've been pretty hard on you this term. You do think that, don't you? Uh, well, sir, I... Well, you think it. And it's quite true, you know, I have been hard on you. And next term, I dare say, I shall be harder. And the term after that, probably harder than ever. You will. Hmm. Sometimes a student comes along and the teacher senses that he is clay and that he can be molded, strengthened, shaped into something. I think it's just possible, Mr. Partridge, that you have a very worthwhile future. And if I can prepare you better for that, then we will both be repaid for the mutual agony we have suffered in one another's company. Well, my father's a lawyer, Professor Turk, and I've sort of intended to make that my profession. I see. Well, you'd better go home and work on the assignments I gave you. If you don't, you're never going to get by the finals. Yes, Professor Turk. Didn't Professor Turk care what you wanted to be, Daddy? He didn't think I had enough sense to know what I wanted to be. And maybe he was right. Who's that girl? That is Judy Dwinell. She was 17 when that picture was taken. You can see how pretty she was. I spent long months thinking and planning and plotting how to get to a T at Delancey School. I got to a point where I couldn't work out of sheer frustration and desperation. Mr. Partridge, 
I kept you after class to work. Now to daydream. I'm sorry, Professor Turk. Oh, what on earth is wrong with you? You don't concentrate in class any longer. Your compositions don't show any thought. Something's wrong, and I want to know what it is. Well, it's very difficult to explain, sir. All right, my boy, out with it. Uh, you wouldn't understand. I, I couldn't possibly tell you. Oh, now it begins to dawn. <clears throat> have you had much appetite lately, Mr. Partridge? Very little, sir. And have you been sleeping at night? Not too well, sir. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Now, who is the young lady? I didn't say it was a young lady. My boy, the symptoms are all too obvious. Now, what is the problem? Well, the problem is I'm a freshman. and Freshmen can't attend the teas at Delancey School, and I haven't even been able to meet her. Hmm. Well, now, uh, there are certain circumstances under which a freshman can attend a tea at Delancey School. There are. A freshman can go if he happens to be escorted by a member of the Hobart faculty. Well, I'm afraid that isn't much help. On the contrary, Mr. Bartridge. I happen to be attending a tea at Delancey School next Friday, and I shall be delighted to have the pleasure of your company. I'm very happy to meet you, Mr. Partridge. Well, thank you, Miss Dwinnell. I'm very happy to meet you, too. You go to Hobart, don't you? Uh, yes. Uh, you go to Delancey, don't you? <laughs> of course. That's where you are, you know. Oh, sure. Sure, you, sure I know. I was just kidding. It's a nice party, isn't it? Oh, very nice. If you like tea. Oh, I, I like tea. So do I. <sighs> well, uh, what are you studying? I'm an English major. Oh, that must be very interesting. My English prof brought me to the tea. That's him over by the door. He introduced us. Don't you remember? Oh, that's right, he did, didn't he? I'm all mixed up somehow today. Oh, the teachers are motioning to us. The tea's over. Oh, don't go. Oh, but I have to. I've been waiting for months to meet you. I had so much I wanted to say to you, and I haven't said any of it. Well, perhaps we'll meet again, Mr. Partridge. And you can say it then. I hope we'll meet again. Well, if you hope we'll meet again, I'm sure we will. months that followed have become, in memory, all set against the backdrop of Judy's smile, Judy's eyes, Judy's voice. I'm so glad you invited me to the freshman prom, Bellamy. I don't know when I've had such fun. Judy, will you come to all the dances with me? As long as I'm in college, will you be my date? You don't want to tie yourself up for the next three years, do you? Well, longer than that, Judy. day for a picnic. I'm so glad you thought of it, Bellamy. I'm so glad you could come. Our last Saturday before we go home for the summer. Are you... Are you going to miss me? I don't know how I'm going to survive until fall. Can't I come to see you? Oh, I'm afraid I can never make Mother understand. But why? Oh, don't ask me now, Bellamy. Let's just enjoy the time we have. There's so little left as it is. Judy, do you care anything for me at all? Of course I do, Bellamy. Of course I do. Bellamy, I must get on the train. It's all ready to pull out. Will you write to me this summer? Of course. Will you write to me? Every day. So will I. Judy, will you take my fraternity pin? Will you wear it? Yes, Bellamy. You know, that means we're engaged unofficially. Yes, Bellamy, but very unofficially. Oh, you can't get on the train now. I must. Goodbye, Bellamy. Goodbye. That first summer without Judy was the longest I'd spent until then. In fact, the only ones that were ever longer were the summers I had to spend later without her. Who's this woman here, Daddy? Gee whiz, she sure looks mad. 
That's uh, Judy's mother, Mrs. Dwinell. She still looks mad. Did you ever meet her? Yes, I certainly did. Did she always look as mad as that? Son, the first time I met her, she looked madder. School was in session again, and she'd come up to see Judy. Judy asked me to come down to the hotel to meet her mother. The situation was just about as strained as a situation could be. I can see Judy now, standing there with a desperate look on her face, saying, Mother, may I present Bellamy Partridge? Mother, Mother may, may I, I present, present Bellamy Partridge? Partridge? Bellamy, this is my mother. Uh, how do you do, Mrs. Dwinell? How do you do? It's a, a nice day, isn't it, Mrs. Dwinell? It's going to rain. Oh, well, I, I hope not. So you're the young boy Judy to told us was boying her around at school. I think that's very kind of you. Particularly since you know that Judy is engaged to an attorney in Rochester. Engaged? Mother, we're not engaged. Well, perhaps not in so many words, but there's been an understanding for some time. You must meet Mr. Cole sometime, Mr. Partridge. He's one of the most distinguished lawyers in this part of the country. He has a beautiful home to take Judy to, and he can give her everything a young girl could want. Mother, how can you talk like that? You know... Now, that Judy, there's no point in keeping anything from Mr. Partridge. It's only fair for him to understand the situation. You do understand now. Don't you, Mr. Partridge? Yes, I understand, Mrs. Dwinell. I understand only too well. moment, we will return to the second act of Salad Days, starring Ronald Reagan. Have you seen the Hallmark Christmas card train? You'll see it in full color in the December issues of Holiday, Ladies' Home Journal, and Better Homes and Gardens. You'll see it at the fine stores where you buy Hallmark cards. And you'll certainly see it in the smartest homes this holiday season. In fact, when you see it, you'll want several for your own home and to send to your friends as your personal Christmas card. For besides being so colorful and gay, the Hallmark Christmas card train is the practical way to enjoy Christmas cards. You know how pleasant it is to have your cards all together so you can show them to the family and friends? Well, the Hallmark Christmas train holds up to 150 Christmas cards. It's six inches high and 38 inches long. The engine has peppermint candy striped wheels and the gaily decorated cars following carry a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year greeting. When you're sending it as a combination, gift and greeting to your friends, there's a place on the bright red caboose for you to sign your name. Can you think of a nicer way to say Merry Christmas? And the Hallmark Christmas card train is so adaptable, you can place it on the mantle, curve it to make a centerpiece for your Christmas table, or station it under the tree to hold Santa's surprises on Christmas morning. And here's more good news. The Hallmark Christmas card train costs only $1, complete with mailing envelope a gift that's all ready to go. Yes, you will surely want to see the Hallmark Christmas card train. It'll make a non-stop run straight to your holiday heart. Plan to see it tomorrow. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Salad Days, starring Ronald Reagan. page of an old album turns, and with it the years pass by. Bellamy Partridge knew he would have to struggle to get what he wanted, and so he did. He knew there was trouble ahead, and he was right. But when it all happened, like so many other things in a man's life, it wasn't much like anything he had ever expected. <laughs> the white whiskers? That was our family doctor, son. He brought me into the world. He bandaged my first skinned knee, taped my first sprained ankle, took care of me off and on from the day I was born until the day he died. The summer I was a junior, he had a serious talk with me. One of the most serious talks I guess I've ever had with anyone. He had me come down to his office and he said to me, Bellamy, there's something I've got to tell you. Bellamy? There's something, something I've got to tell you. I don't quite know how to begin. Now, what is it, Doc? 
You know how we worried last winter about all those colds? I haven't got a cold now. You've got a cough. Bellamy, I've had you down here going through all those examinations because I was afraid of that cough. Well, I'd certainly like to get rid of it before school starts. I'm carrying quite a load this term. Son, I wish I didn't have to tell you this. But I'm afraid you're not going to be able to start back to school next month. What do you mean? If you're going to get over that cough, I'm afraid you're going to have to go out west for a few months. Out west? What do you mean I, I won't graduate this year? I won't finish with my class? I won't get... I to... know what a disappointment this must be for you. But I also know you can meet it, Bellamy. You must meet it. Judy, I came to see you because this was something I just couldn't write to you. Oh, Bellamy, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, the toughest thing to take is leaving you. I don't mind the rest so much, but leaving you, Judy, you know how I feel about you. You've known from the beginning, haven't you? Oh, of course I have. Will you wait, Judy? Yeah, I'll wait, Bellamy. Is this Judy's picture too, Daddy? Yes, that's Judy's picture too. That's the way Judy looked when I came back from out west. I was sunburned, healthy, and full of self-confidence. I got off the train, saw my family, and then I got on another train and headed for Judy's hometown. I walked straight up to the door and rang the bell. I didn't care whether her mother came to the door or not. I was no longer afraid of anyone or anything, except the possibility that Judy might have changed toward me. But the minute she opened the door and said my name, I knew. Bellamy. Oh, Bellamy. Judy, Judy, let me look at you. Oh, you're still the prettiest girl in the whole doggone country. You know that. Well, why didn't you let me know you were coming? I wanted to surprise you. Is your mother here? No, no, she's out. Father's in the library. Well, I want to ask someone for your hand in marriage customary to go to a girl's father, but in your case, well, what do you think? Well, I think you should ask father, because that's the proper thing to do. Father, of course, won't give you an answer. He'll say you have to ask mother. So then you ask mother, and after she says no, you ask me, Bellamy, because I've been ready with my answer for a long time. That's all I want to know. Which door leads to the library? That one. All right, here I go. Yes? Judge Dwinell, I want to marry your daughter. You want to? What's your name? Bellamy Partridge. Partridge, Partridge. Oh, of course. Well, we haven't seen you for some time, Bellamy. Uh, my eyesight isn't all it used to be. Uh, so, you want to marry Judy, do you? Yes, sir. Well, I, I'm afraid you'll have to ask Judy's mother. Ask me what? Oh, hello, Mrs. Dwinell. Uh, my dear, this is... Uh, I know who uh, this is. What is it you want, Mr. Partridge? I want to marry Judy. Ridiculous. I won't hear of such nonsense. It isn't nonsense, Mother. I love Bellamy and he loves me. He hasn't even finished school, has he? Well, uh, He's going to finish school. He's going to be a lawyer like his father and my father. And how are you going to live? We'll manage. We aren't going to wait any longer, Mother. We're leaving tonight to get married. I'll not hear of such a thing. Then just I won't have... one minute, Mariah. You've said quite enough. Now, you sit down and listen to someone else for a change. Judy is going to be married in her own home to the man of her choice. She's going to have a proper wedding. That is, if the young folks are willing to wait long enough for us to make the suitable arrangements. Uh, are you, Judy? Are you, Bellamy? Yes, of course we'll wait. But only long enough to make the suitable arrangements. And that last picture in the album is the minister that married us. That was the beginning of my real happiness, the beginning of my life. That isn't the last picture in the album, Daddy. There's one more. Oh? 
So there is. Now, who do you suppose that is? Well, I don't know, but whoever it is should have some clothes on. That's you, my boy, at the tender age of four weeks. It is? Well, I don't think that was a very nice trick to take a picture of me like that. Well, I think it's time this young man was in bed. What, what on earth are you doing with that old book of pictures? We were just going over the story of my life. And we'd come to the beginning of a very important chapter. What happens in it? Tell me, Daddy. No more tonight, my boy. It's bedtime. Well, Daddy, just one more question. Did you live happily ever after? Son, that's an ending for fairy stories, not for life. Life isn't that simple. But taking it all in all, I've had many more good times than bad ones. And throughout all that has happened, your mother's been with me, sharing the work and the fun. So the one thing I'm really certain of is this. The luckiest moment in all my life was when I met her. and James Hilton will return in a moment. When you're buying that Hallmark Christmas card train, take a look at another bit of Christmas beauty. Hallmark gift wrappings for your Christmas presents. Hallmark gift wrappings are completely coordinated. Select a basic color scheme and you'll find there's matching paper, seals, and tags for your feminine gifts, your masculine gifts, and those wonderful gifts you'll be wrapping for the children. Also, Hallmark designs are scaled to the size of the box you'll be wrapping. So if you'd like your gifts to be the ones everyone wants to open first on Christmas morning, select Hallmark Gift Wrappings. You'll find them at fine stores across the country. You'll know them by their beauty. And by that familiar Hallmark and crown you always look for on the back of cards when you care enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you for being with us on the Hallmark Playhouse tonight, Ronnie. I expect your performance took many of our audience back to their own college days. It certainly brought back memories to me. Well, to me too, Jimmy. I always enjoy your Hallmark Playhouse stories. And by the way, you know those Hallmark Christmas card trains Frank Goss was talking about earlier tonight? Well, I think they're the best addition to holiday fun we've seen in a long time, and I'm so grateful for the one given to me tonight. You know, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be an engineer. <laughs> well, you won't have to be any kind of engineer to put the Hallmark Christmas card train together. It's a very easy thing to do. In fact, the whole idea is a delightful one. Well, it's made my visit doubly enjoyable. Now, what's your story for next week? Next week, we shall dramatize Marcella Tarrant's The Night of the Hayride, the story of how a lonely woman recaptured her lost life and found her happiness again. And as our star, we are delighted to have charming Loretta Young. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was adapted by Jean Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Ronald Reagan appeared tonight for the courtesy of Warner Brothers, producers of I'll See You in My Dream, starring Doris Day and Danny Thomas. The role of Judy tonight was played by Barbara Eiler. Others in our cast included Barbara Jean Wong, Myra Marsh, Ted Osborne, Eddie Firestone, Parley Bear, and Ted DeCorsia. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Loretta Young in Marcella Talon's The Night of the Hayride and the week following Lorenzo Sears' John Hancock starring Dana Andrews and the week after that our traditional Christmas presentation Hair to Pauly's The Story of Silent Night on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs>